Thank you. I mean, it's uh, an incredible honor to um, be here to honor Richard at his 80th. And I, it's a little bit daunting for me because, you know, um, I think many, I'm mean, going to be talking about symmetric functions, but I think many of you know a hell of a lot more about symmetric functions than I do. So I really hope I don't make a fool of myself. Um, the trouble is, you know, I'm not a real native born combinatorialist. I'm an immigrant from physics, uh, but maybe you can just call me born again. Uh, but anyway, um, so what I want to talk about are some interesting conjectures. There, I mean, there are really almost no theorems in this talk, but some conjectures that, that I find intriguing, and I hope some of you will find intriguing, and hopefully, you know, we can get them proved before Richard Linus. So, so let's go. Um, so here's the basic theme. It's actually a theme I've been obsessed with for, for about the last 10 years in different contexts. It's upgrading a positivity property in the following sense. Consider a polynomial, let's say with real coefficients in one or more indeterminates x. Um, and there are two kinds of positivity properties you might consider. So one is pointwise positivity on a plus. So that means give all the variables values that are non-negative, um, and the output is then non-negative. So that's what I call pointwise positivity. A, a, a different uh, kind of positivity, a stronger kind, is coefficient-wise positivity, namely all the coefficients of the polynomial are non-negative. Of course, coefficient-wise positivity implies pointwise positivity, but it's stronger. I mean, uh, one minus x squared is non-negative on the positive real axis, is actually non-negative on the whole real line, but it's obviously not coefficient-wise non-negative. So what I'm interested in, is the point is many theorems in algebra or combinatorics um, assert some kind of a point-wise positivity. A bunch of variables are non-negative, that implies that something is non-negative. And I ask, can they be upgraded to a coefficient-wise positivity? Um, so that's been my exception for the last 10 years, I guess, and it's mostly been concerned with total positivity of angle matrices, but here you'll see in a second I'll be talking about total positivity of templates matrices, which is a kind of um, opposite thing. Okay, so let's start with uh, negative real rooted polynomials. A polynomial with real coefficients in one variable is negative real rooted if what you think. Namely, all, well, either it's identically zero or all of its complex zeros actually um, are non negative, I'm sorry, are negative real or zero. That's all, the, all its complex roots in the negative real axis. Um, and for simplicity, I'll normalize to P of zero equals one. So then you can just factor it in terms of the roots. So you have these non negative numbers alpha i, which are the negative reciprocals of the zeros of p. And then there's a generalization of this, the so-called Ligier folder class LP plus of entire functions. It's just those entire functions that are uniform, uh, that are limits uniformly on compact subsets of the complex plane of negative real rooted polynomials. And it's a theorem due to Ligier that an entire function, again, let's normalize it to f of zero equals one, belongs to LP plus if and only if it can be written as an infinite product of, so it's like a, it's like a polynomial of infinite degree, right? It's an infinite product where the alpha i's are non-negative and summable, and then you also allow an extra factor e to the gamma t with gamma non-negative. That's kind of like having zeros at minus infinity. Okay, so that's that's the result of the like air. Uh, okay, so now let me introduce the concept of total positivity. A finite or infinite matrix of real numbers is called totally positive if all its minors are not negatives. And I stress all. You take any subset of rows and any subset of columns of the same cardinality, that minor is supposed to be non-negative. And um, so this is a kind of bizarre concept from the point of view of general linear algebra because it's grossly basis dependent. Um, but of course, many in, in many fields of mathematics, there is a natural preferred basis. And of course, that's true 
frequently in enumerative combinatorics where the rows and columns of the matrix are indexed by sizes of something. So um, total positivity actually has applications to many, many fields of mathematics. Um, the ones that interest me most are the three at the bottom. So as I said, I've been obsessed with total positivity of Hankel matrices, and that um, happens to be related to the skills at moment problem in analysis. But here we're going to be talking about total positivity of Teplitz matrices, and that relates to what I've just shown you, zeros of polynomials and entire functions. So again, if you want to rephrase this basic theme of upgrading in the language of total positivity, we want to generalize the theory of total positivity from matrices of real numbers to matrices with entries in a partially ordered commutative ring. Now, what is a partially ordered commutative ring is what you think it is. It's a commutative ring where you declare a bunch of elements non-negative, zero and one are non-negative, sums and products of non-negative things are non-negative, and the only thing that's non-negative and non-positive is zero. That's the obvious definition, but I stress many people who work in uh, real algebraic geometry, their partially ordered commutative rings, they assume the squares are non-negative. And I don't do that because the prototypical example I have in mind is a ring of polynomials with the coefficient wise order. And of course, one, as I've showed, one minus x whole thing squared is not coefficient wise non-negative. So we're working in partially ordered commutative rings, but in the back of our mind, the example we're most interested in is a ring of polynomials with the coefficient wise order. And then total positivity is defined in the usual way. A matrix is totally positive if all of its minors are not negative in the partial order of the, of the ring. Okay, so now let's talk about Teplitz total positivity. So you have a sequence, uh, uh, an infinite sequence AN, and one sided infinite sequence, and we define its Teplitz matrix. So this is a lower triangular Teplitz matrix, it's constant on diagonals, and it encodes the uh, the sequence A, and we'll, we'll say that the sequence A is Teplitz totally positive if its Teplitz matrix is totally positive. Um, it's also called a folio frequency sequence. And of course, that implies that the sequence is log concave. You see that by looking at the two by two minors. But it's, of course, much stronger because we're saying that all the minors are non negative, not just the two by twos. And this definition makes sense in any partially ordered commutative ring. Okay, for uh, sequences of real numbers, and again, I'll normalize them to A naught equals one, there's a, a beautiful theorem that uh, says when is a sequence that was totally positive, it says it's true if and only if the ordinary generating function of the sequence looks like I wrote. So it's a product like I showed for the Laguerre folio class LT plus. You have um, zeros on the negative real axis, posits, possibly infinitely many of them. You have an exponential, but you also have poles on the positive real axis. You have this denominator. So that's what it means for a sequence of real numbers to be tablets totally positive. And but of course, at the card level, you get for the cases where there are no denominators. First of all, a finite sequence, that's a finite sequence and then all zeros, is kept as totally positive if and only if the polynomial it generates is negative real rooted. And an infinite sequence that decays fast enough so that the generating function has infinite radius of convergence is kept as totally positive if and only if the entire function that it generates belongs to the Laguerre folio class LT plus. Okay. And so those are the cases we're most interested in, the cases with no denominators. Okay, so now let me just review partial orders on the ring of symmetric functions. Symmetric functions come into the game for the obvious reason that if you write a polynomial and you factor it in terms of the alpha i, the reciproc negative reciprocals of the root, <laughs> the coefficients of the polynomial are elementary symmetric functions. And so here are some partial orders on the uh, ring of symmetric functions. So um, yesterday we saw people trying to upgrade. Uh, where's this pointer? Someone knows this one. Oh, but turn the uh, thing around. Oh, oh thank you. 
<laughs> okay, so yesterday we saw several talks where people were trying to upgrade from sure non-negative to E non-negative. I'm going to be much lower on the scale. I'm going to be trying to upgrade pointwise non-negative to monomial non-negative to maybe sure non-negative. Okay. And so again, the basic theme is can we do upgrades? So here's a simple example. Consider again the, the, the basic polynomial whose coefficients are, are, uh, are indeterminate alpha. So uh, I'm sorry, whose uh, factors are indeterminate alpha. So the coefficients are elementary symmetric functions. So if the alphas are non negative real numbers, then this polynomial is negative real rooted. And then by the easy half of Mason and Dreyer Schoenberg Whitney, the sequence of elementary symmetric functions evaluated at those alphas is tetras totally positive. So that is a pointwise version where um, alpha is non negative implies that the sequence is tetras totally positive. And then I ask, can it be upgraded? And the answer is yes, it can be doubly upgraded by Jacobi Trudy. The tepless minors of the EIs are skewed sure functions, and skewed sure functions are non negative linear combinations of sure functions. So we can doubly upgrade from pointwise positivity to monomial positivity to sure positivity. So, so that's nice. Um, but the question is are there other results of, of the same kind? So let me remind you about some classical theorems from the analytic theory of polynomials. Most of these things, most of the things I'm going to quote, were proven in the last decades of the 19th century or the first decades of the 20th century. The point is the class of negative real rooted polynomials, or more generally, the class of entire functions in the Laguerre Polyer class LP, plus, is closed under several types of bilinear composition. So let f and g be two such functions. Well, one is just the ordinary product, right? I mean, the, the zeros of the ordinary product are the unions of the zeros of the f and the g. So that's trivial. Um, but here's something less trivial, the Hadamard product. Some people might call it the freshman product, right? <laughs> <laughs> the freshman students we don't know how to multiply polynomials. Um, it's a non trivial fact. I uh, can't remember the name of the, the person who proved it around 1900 that um, Mano, who showed that the Hadamard product preserves negative overhearedness. Same for the factorial Hadamard product, putting it in factorial. Same for differential composition, F of DDT applied to G of T. And same for Laguerre composition, F of T DDT applied to G of T. Okay. And notice what does F of T DDT do? It changes T to the N to N T to the N. So F of T DDT applied to G of T multiplies the coefficients, I don't know if you can see it, but multiplies the coefficients at the bottom, coefficients of the polynomial by F of N, where F is a, the first polynomial. Okay, so we have these different kinds of compositions that preserve negative real rootedness, and we can ask for each of these results, is there an upgrading from pointwise positivity to monomial or sure positivity? And, well, you just do experiments on, on, on the computer, the answer is no, for sure. If you want to, you, you try to upgrade these things to sure positivity, and they're easy counterexamples, what's your and starting at n equals six or something. But empirically, the answer seems to be yes for monomial positivity for all of the classical theorems that I stated earlier. I mean, I've checked this to roughly n equals 10 or 11 for, for all of these things. So for example, here are my conjectures for Hadamard product and factorial Hadamard product. You take two sequences of elementary symmetric functions in two different sets of variables, x and y, you form the Hadamard product, you form the Teplitz matrix of that and the minors of that, and then you expand those Teplitz minors in the monomial symmetric functions of x and y, and empirically all the coefficients are not negative. Same seems to be true for um, the factorial Hadamard product. 
And then you can iterate this. You can take three factors and take n factorial to the either 0, 1, or 2. Or more generally, you can take k factors and have anything up to k minus 1 factorials. All of those seem empirically to be uh, monomial positive in all of uh, those sets of n determinants. Okay, here's an, an example for Laguerre composition. Um, so my g, you see, is, is the coefficients are just going to be en of x. The f that's doing the action is going to be a negative real rooted polynomial. So I'll write it in terms of the roots, and that just multiplies the coefficients en of x by something of the form ai plus bin, a finite product of those things. And empirically, this is monomial positive in x, but not just. It's, co it's so coefficient wise in the a's and b's. That is, if you look, you expand the tuplets minus with this in the monomial symmetric functions of the x, the coefficients are polynomials with non negative coefficients in the a's and b's. Or you can make a variant conjecture, just multiply it by coefficients cn, where now the cn's are real numbers. And if the cn over n factorial generates um, an entire function in like Aeropolia class, then uh, the monomial positivity seems to be true. Um, so cn is a product of ai, a plus bi, and is a special case of that. But, but of course, now it's no longer coefficient y being a and b. So these two conjectures are similar, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can find a common generalization of them. They kind of go in slightly different directions. And I can say the very conjecture actually is a consequence of the conjecture on the preceding slide about a factorial Hadamard product. Because if, if this is like a polio class, then CN over N factorial can be approximated by elementary symmetric functions of some variables Y. So these conjectures are related to each other. So here was Richard's idea for proving these conjectures. Uh, the tuplets minors of E and are, as we saw, positive linear combinations of sure functions. So Richard said, why don't we just consider the homomorphism uh, of the ring of symmetric functions that maps E n, oh, sorry, that maps E n to f of n E n, where f is any function you like, but f of zero should be one. Because remember, E zero is one. E zero is not a free thing in the ring. And so you want f of zero to be one to handle E naught correctly. But other than that, f of n can be any function you like. Consider this homomorphism. Then the tuplets minors of f of n e n are just the images of sure functions under this homomorphism. So we should we want to ask what are the images of the sure functions under this homomorphism, and when are they monomial positive? In particular, what happens when f of n is the product of one plus bi n's? So I want to introduce a polynomial generalization of the Casca numbers. So remember, the Casca numbers are is the matrix that, that gives you that expands the sure functions in terms of um, monomial functions. And so, so the cost and the Casca number k lambda alpha is the number of semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda and content alpha. And remember that this matrix is lower triangular in the sense of the uh, dominance order. It's non-zero only when mu is less than or equal to lambda, and it's unit lower triangular the diagonal elements or what. Okay, so now let, N, let f be any f of the kind that I said, with f, f of zero equals one, and look at phi f of f lambda, expand that, in terms of monomial symmetric functions, and I'll define these generalized Casca numbers kf. What can we say about them? And so here's my conjecture for when f of n is of the kind I said, a finite product of one plus bin, then I conjecture that these generalized Casca numbers are polynomials with non-negative coefficients in the bi's. And if that's true, that would imply the conjecture about Laguerre composition, 
that um, that I showed a few slides back. And so the question is, can we find a combinatorial description of these polynomials, either the KFs in general or the Ks as functions of Bs when F has this uh, specific form? Well, what do we know? Well, one thing is it's non-zero in the same situation where the um, uh, ordinary cost of numbers are not zero only when mu is less than or equal to lambda. Here's a, a nice uh, result which I conjectured from experiments and used for not to be uh, proved, namely the diagonal elements are known. The diagonal elements are just products of the F on the sides of the dual uh, partition, that is to say the, the lengths of the columns of of lambda. And then, you know, by experimentation, we had a bunch of conjectures about various other special cases. I mean, here's one example, don't worry about it. But, the, you know, and there's some conjectures about what these things are. Um, so let, let me focus on the case where f of n is 1 plus bn. So then we have a polynomial in one variable, k lambda mu of b. And empirically, here's what I find. So first of all, it's it non-zero if and only if the ordinary uh, cost of number is, is non-zero. Um, when it's, when it's non-zero, what is its degree? Its degree is uh, lambda one, the size of the largest part in lambda, so the size of the first row. Last row for the French people, but anyway. <laughs> Um, okay, what else do we know? So here, here's where this really started. From experimentation, here's what I found. I looked at the case where lambda just has one row of size n, and I found in theory that k lambda mu of b is a sum over marked semi-standard young tableau. So what do I mean by that? First of all, in this case, there is a unique semi-standard Young tableau of shape n and content mu. So take that semi-standard Young tableau and just mark any subset of cells that you like. So for each subset of one through n, including the empty set, for each of those subsets, um, uh, you mark the cells in S, you form the subword using the cells in S, let L of S be its length, and let weight of S be the number of distinct permutations of that subword. So if the subword is 3333, three, 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 then the weight is 1. If the subword sub is 3334, three, three, then I guess the weight is 4, and so on. And so my conjecture is that the uh, matrix that when lambda equals just n, the matrix element is b to the length the weight multiple, the coefficient is the weight summed over all subsets. And I've checked that, that conjecture up to n equals 11. So, so I'm fairly sure that conjecture in that special case is true. Then the question is how to deal with lambdas that have more than one row. So here was my first attempt. For each contributing semi standard young tableau, mark zero or one cells in each column. Now, why zero or one? Go back to this result for the diagonal elements. It's the product of F of lambda prime i. For the F that I'm considering, one plus bn, this is one product of one plus b lambda prime i, and that means in each column, I either mark zero cells to get a weight one, or I mark one of the lambda prime i cells to get a weight c. So that influenced me to say, okay, I'm going to, uh, for each contributing semi-standard Young tableau, I will mark zero or one cells in each column, I'll sum over all the ways of doing that. And then what is the weight in each row I, I let SI be the subword of marked cells, and each I let the length and the weight be the same. And so basically I just take this weight, 
that you saw from the one row case, apply it separately to each row, take the product over rows, and then take the sum now, sum over all the penny stranded young tableau that contribute because there's more than one in general, sum over all the markings. That, that was my conjecture. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work. It works for quite a lot of cases, but um, it's wrong in some cases. So the first, if you get the diagonal elements all right, as, as you saw, it gets many cases right, but also many wrong. So the first one that it gets wrong is lambda is 3, 1, and mu is 2, 2. I can't remember. I think there's a 6 um, in the polynomial and the conjecture. If one of the terms is a 6, and the conjecture gives a 7. So at that point, the, the, um, the conjecture always gave results that were too high. So a user and not me and I were looking at this, and we tried to make extra conditions to say, okay, we're not going to take all the markings of zero or one cells in each column, but we'll put extra restrictions and somehow try to get the right polynomials. But then I did experiments up to higher end. I can't remember starting, I think at n equals seven. There were some cases where this conjecture is too low. So it's not just a question of adding extra restrictions to something else. You know, there may be some minus signs, minus one to the n or something going in somewhere, minus one to some statistic, maybe. I don't know. So, so the upshot is, I don't know what the story is, but I think there is a story. There should be a combinatorial interpretation of um, well, first of all, if this polynomial in one variable, k lambda mu would be, um, that somehow generalizes what seems to be true for the one row case. Then if we can get that, then generalize it to the multivariable b1, b2, b3, and then uh, maybe ultimately just, or, or maybe the way to go is to just figure out is what is k lambda mu for a general f, which will have minus signs, but then you plug in F equals these particular products and you see all your plus signs. So there are various ways that we might go at it. Um, I don't know how to go, but um, I think it's an intriguing um, uh, class of, of conjectures. It's a very natural generalization of the Costa numbers. So I think it's just in its own right, it's an interesting thing in the theory of symmetric functions, but especially these conjectures are very natural upgradings of things we know from the analytic theory of polynomials. And so it would be really very interesting. As I said, I'm convinced that it's true that they are monomial positive. And so I suppose somebody here will be motivated to figure out how to prove it. So thank you.